أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In an eloquent sermon سيدنا ومولانا أمير المؤمنين ومولى الموحدين علي بن أبي طالب states and indeed the Holy Quran is a form of enlightenment that never extinguishes and a vast ocean that is endless and a methodology that never takes us astray a methodology in which if we were to follow if we were to adhere by then it will always take us home just like a navigation system or even better for those who don't know a specific direction they put the address and their navigation system and their vehicles and it tells you to make a right, make a left, a U-turn, take this freeway, take this, this exit and then it tells you, you have reached your destination. It doesn't take you astray. 90% of the time or 99% of the time it also takes you from the best route possible. But there are times and occasions that even the navigation does not know of a specific route change. Or it takes you from a longer route. The Qur'an is that navigation that always takes you home. Keeps you safe and protected. That is why at a night like this, we must come to the Qur'an. And amongst the greatest of questions that we're ought to ask from the Qur'an at an evening like this is to define the role of woman and especially woman in the West. To define or redefine the role of Muslim woman living in Western countries. Tonight, from the noon of the day of Ashura onwards, the hero of Karbala, the hero of the message of Imam Hussein, the one who carries the torch of enlightenment of Imam Hussein, was a Sayyida Zainab. She was the one that continued the message of Imam Hussein. She was that brave lioness that stood in the face of the injustice. And at the same time, she protected the orphans of Hussein. And she remained patient. She saw the head of her brother Hussein, her brother Abbas, Ja'far, Abdullah, Uthman, her own sons her nephews, her cousins, beheaded on top of spears. And when she's asked by the tyrant, how did you find what happened to you? Did you see how Allah humiliated you, belittled you? She looks at him and with all confidence, she says, Wallah ma ra'aytu illa jameela. From Allah, I did not see anything but good. And when we come to such a personality, we must ask ourselves, are the women in the Islamic community today around the Muslim world playing the same role as a Sayyida Zainab? Taking such important steps as al aqil Zainab. I recall last year I was approached by a revert to Islam. 
which also happened to be a woman. She came to me and say it, said, say it, what does it mean for me to be a Muslim woman? And I understood that she wasn't just asking me a simple question in which I would respond to by saying, you're just a Muslim that happens to be a woman. So I said in order for us to understand and comprehend the magnitude of this question, we would have to redefine our understanding of the status of women in the following three ways. One, we have to eliminate the cultural definition of the status of women in Islam. And indeed today, culture plays a big role in defining the role of woman in Islam. You find in some Muslim countries, women cannot drive. In some Muslim countries, women cannot vote. In some countries, women cannot even travel by themselves. Is this the Islamic teachings? Or is this a cultural definition of the status of woman? Two, we also have to be able to remove the stereotypes when it comes to the status of woman in the religion of Islam. And there are many stereotypes surrounding the role of woman, the status of woman. Amongst the very famous stereotypes that we constantly hear of is the female genital mutilation. We have to understand that if this practice takes place in Africa, we have to understand that if this practice takes place by some Muslims, indeed it's not an Islamic practice or an Islamic teaching. It's a practice done by Africans in Africa, some Africans in Africa, regardless whether they are Muslim or not Muslim. In fact, the majority of those practicing this act happen to be in predominantly Christian lands in Africa. Third, which is the most important, and I believe that it should take the greatest attention in examining this topic is the examination of Islamic text and the Islamic scripture. For, for the most part, the Islamic scripture has been analyzed and examined and defined by men. And I don't mean for women to now come and say we're the ones that understand the Islamic text, not the fuqaha and the marajah. So we're going to understand it the way we want to understand it and interpret it the way we, are, we want to interpret it. No. What I'm saying is, indeed women understand themselves and their existence better than men. That's a given. But there are need to take the necessary steps to become fuqaha and mujtahids and mufassirs and then re-examine the hadith according to their understanding as a faqih, as a mujtahid and as a female. And this is a personality that we lack in the Muslim ummah today. A faqih a mujtahid alongside the fuqaha and the mujtahideen in Najaf, in Qom, in Karbala, different hawzat that would come and examine the hadith, not only as a faqih, but also according to their understanding as women. Come and examine Surat al-Nisa, the hadith that speaks of the status of women. <coughs> the Stories that inspire women throughout the Holy Quran are better understood by female mufassirin of the Quran than the men. 
And that's a reality. A woman would be able to relate much more with the inspiring story of Surah Maryam within the Holy Quran. A woman would be able to relate much more with the story of Imra'at Fir'aun. إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ ابْنِ لِي عَنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجْنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجْنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ If we can take those three elements and allow them to resonate within our communities, we then will be able to define and understand the status of women without biases. That is why I have chosen to examine chapter 27, verse 23 of the Holy Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the hudhud, the peacock, or the hubo, right? I guess that's how it's pronounced, the hudhud, that comes and tells Sulaiman. Now Sulaiman was not just an ordinary prophet. He was a prophet that was given the largest kingdom. He had an army from the jinn. He had an army from the malaika, the angels. He had an army of human beings, a heart, and an army of animals. And every day they would march in front of him and he would look at them. And apparently, the commander of the army of the animals was this peacock, the hudhud. So Sulaiman asks, where is the hudhud? And the hudhud is missing. <laughs> the hudhud is missing, and it returns momentarily. So it says, Sulaiman, I have news for you, which you're not aware of. I'm about to tell you something which you don't know. Just go ahead. It says, إِنِّي وَجَدْتُ مْرَأَةً تَمْلِكُهُمْ وَأُوْتِيَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَلَهَا عَرْشٌ عَظِيمٌ I found them belonging to a woman. I found a great kingdom belonging to a woman that has been given from everything and has a great throne. Of course, this woman was the queen of Sheba. And she was the queen of her land. Now, the important question is, how is it that a hudhud, a bird, knows something which a prophet of God does not know? How is it that a peacock is teaching a prophet of God? Is this logical? And that's indeed one of the very first questions that the Mufassirin discuss when examining this ayah. And in response they say that just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Ya'qub that your son is alive and he felt that his son Yusuf was alive. وَلَكِنْ أَخْفَ اللَّهُ مَكَانَهُ لِحِكْمَةِ did not inform him of his whereabouts due to a wisdom, a greater wisdom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not disclose the <coughs> kingdom of Sheba and the queen of Sheba to Sulaiman due to a greater wisdom. And of course the wisdom is embedded in the story of Sulaiman. If you see how he then asks those around him, who is there to bring me the queen of Sheba's throne? There is two offers, one comes from a jinn and one comes from a human being. The jinn says, I will bring you her throne before you stand up. Can you imagine bringing her throne in? Apparently she had a great throne, a magnificent throne. And a man who had some of the knowledge of the book. He had the knowledge of some of the knowledge of the book. Says, I will bring you the queen of Sheba's throne before the blink of an eye. So... 
the throne was transferred. Then this woman came. It's a long story. This woman came and she saw her throne. And she saw that it's in the position of Suleiman. So Suleiman says, does this throne look familiar to you? She said, it looks like my throne. I believe that this is my throne. When she saw this great miracle from the Prophet Sulaiman, she submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the ayah says, Inni wajadtum ra'atan tamlikuhum. A woman that governs them. A woman that's their queen. When discussing this ayah, the Mufassirin are divided into two types, two categories, two opinions. One that says Islam condemns women to take such a leadership position, to be a queen, to be a governor, to be a president. And the other says no. Now let's look at the hadiths that are used by those who believe are under the impression that women cannot take such important roles, cannot take leadership positions. She cannot serve as the president or prime minister in a country. One is a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that says, لَنْ يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ وَلُّوا أَمْرَهُمْ أَمْرَهُمْ Will not see victory the nation which chooses its leader to be a woman. That's first. Second, they say that Imam Ali al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Women are naqisatul uquli wa deen. Have lesser brains and lesser iman. So, due to that, we cannot choose a woman to be the leader of a society. You see, when we and then we examine those hadiths and ayat. Do we examine them without a background? Do we examine them without understanding the ilm of fiqh, the ilm of usul? If we do so, there is definitely going to be a misunderstanding of the text. That is why the fuqaha mention the following three elements when examining this hadith. Number one, it's called al-qara'in. The circumstance surrounding the hadith. When did Rasulullah say this? Did Rasulullah, for example, say this when he was doing the tafsir of Surat Al-Nisa? Did he say this when he was speaking of the affairs of women? Did he speak of this when he was speaking of, of the affairs of politics? Or did he say this when he was speaking of a specific incident? Those are called the qara'in. The hints surrounding the statement. We have to understand that that's why a faqih needs to understand the hadith not only through its chain of narrators, but the circumstance and the history surrounding the hadith. Number two, when Amir al-Mu'mineen says that women have lesser brains and lesser iman. Did he say this when he was speaking? Of women? Did he say this when he was speaking of describing, for example, the status of women in Islam? Doing the tafsir of, for example, Surat al Nisa? Or he, did he say this when he was speaking of a specific incident? And that is why the fuqaha say that we have something called al hukm al aam and hukm al khas. We have a hukm, we have a statement that is specific about a specific incident and we ha and that is hukm al khas and we have a hukm that is am that is general and it speaks of an in of a it speaks without having to refer to a specific incident when you examine both those hadiths you find that the first one was when rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was speaking of Kesra and how the Persians chose their leader to be a woman. Rasulullah was saying that this woman would not remain in power. This woman will fail. Not because she's a woman, but he was speaking of the future. 
And in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas went and he took over the Persians. And it was her which was sitting on the throne of the kingdom. And it was her that collapsed. And it was her that lost power. And Rasulullah said this when referring to the kingdom of Kasra. When referring to the specific female that was in power. It wasn't that he was giving a speech about whether women should take such positions or not. And that is very important to keep in mind when understanding the Islamic text. So this is removed from Al-Hukm Al-Aam to Al-Hukm Al-Khas. It's a specific issue that Rasulullah was speaking of. Similarly, Amir al muminin did not say this. A year after the demise of Rasulullah, two years, three years, ten years, he specifically said this after Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, waged a war against him. So he says, if this woman had a greater brain, she would not have waged a war that caused the killing of 18,000 believers. So he was speaking of a specific woman, a specific incident where a woman had taken charge, and lesser iman. She has lesser iman because if she had greater iman or if she was at the peak of her iman, she would have known the position and the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She would not have joined an army or made an army to come and face Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, Al haqq ma'a Ali wa Ali ma'al haqq. Ali is with truth, Ali is with haqq, Ali is with justice, and justice is with Ali. And he says to Ammar, if you saw all the people taking another road, and Ali by himself taking a separate road, make sure you're a father of Ali ibn Abi Talib. For justice is with him, and he is with justice. And this hadith is muttafaqun alayhi. There is a consensus amongst all Muslims when it comes to those hadith. And he was the Khalifa that received a unanimous bay'ah. Everyone came to give him allegiance. He did not appoint himself. And yet after he took the Khilafah, there was an army that he had to face. So the scholars has spoke, have spoken of those incidents as hukmun khas, a specific statement and a specific time, and not a general one. Why? I'll tell you why. Because a woman is either a daughter, or a mother, or a wife. And the emotions of the entire community is surrounded or affected by the woman in the community. So if you have a daughter and you come home and she's crying, the first thing that you do is you go and you speak to her, you love her, you kiss her. Why is it that you're crying? If she tells you that, for example, someone bothered me, someone harassed me, even if it was your son, then you go and you tell them, Baba, why did you do that? Don't you know she's a girl? Don't you know you have to be kind to her? Don't you, don't you know you have to be compassionate with her? Or she's a mother. And a mother would come and tell you, Oh my son, I have difficulties. I have troubles. Wouldn't you do whatever it takes to remove her pain and agony and difficulty? When you see your mother working so hard and you have an extra moment, wouldn't you go and help her out? Bring ease to her? So either she's a wife, or a mother, or a daughter, and the emotions surround them, belong to them, meaning they're the ones that mobilize emotions in a community. So imagine if God comes and puts them aside. That is an element of destruction in faith. That is an element of destruction of that religion. But indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear in the Holy Quran that He created men and women equal. And He put them in the same status. 
But it is us that has created this separation. It is us that has changed our understanding of the religion of Islam and its text. And that is why I call to re-examine and redefine our understanding of those texts. Why? Because if you eliminate the role of woman in society, you've eliminated half of your abilities. That's like only using your right hand and never using your left. You're eliminating 50% of your assets. I know in some communities in America, the women by themselves are able to raise one million dollars a year for their Islamic centers. Something that the men cannot do. One million dollars. That's because they took a leadership position. They understand the importance of the role that needs to be played by a woman. They chose a Sayyidah Zainab to be their role model. They did not shy away from this great responsibility. And if the Quran speaks of this woman who was the queen of Sheba and had the ability to rule a land, then we have to understand that we should also give leadership positions to women, whether it's in our countries or in our communities. You go to certain communities, you find that the whole board of trustees, board of management, board of decision making in an Islamic center, Islamic institution is all men. That's a loss, it's not a gain. You've lost half of your assets. You have not invested in 50% of your abilities. And sometimes it's not really the fault of the men. It's because no woman really step up and say, we want to be part of it. We want to have a say. We also want to donate. We also want to support. It's because there are many men who choose to go to the Hawza, who choose to study, who choose to become fuqaha, who choose to become mujtahids. And that is why we need to motivate the sisters in our community. Go to the Hawza, study, attend the classes of tafsir, attend the classes of fiqh, attend the classes of usul. Become a mujtahid. Enable yourself to derive Islamic law from the kitab and the sunnah and the ijma' and the aql and give a fatwa. The school of Ahlul Bayt has opened such a door for its adherers and its followers. And before I conclude, I would like to speak of the position of a woman in Islamic history that was one of the greatest women, indeed a role model, magnificent biography. As Sayyidah Nafisa bint al Hassan al Anwar bin Zayd al Aplaj ibn al Imam al Hassan ibn al Imam Ali alayhi salam. Sayyidah Nafisa, the granddaughter of Imam Hassan. And I will examine her biography in the following order. Number one, her birth and marriage. Number two, her migration to Egypt. Number three, how she reformed the perspective of female scholarship. And we'll talk about her students and fiqh. And number four, her attributes, her characteristics and personality. Wa sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Sayyidah was born in the city of Mecca in the year 145 after the Hijrah. And her father was, of course, one of the grandsons of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He noticed the purity of this young lady. He noticed that when she would re re hear the Qur'an, she would begin to recite the Qur'an as she heard it, and she would memorize it instantly. 
So he took her to the grave of her grandfather, Rasulullah. He sat her in front of the grave of Rasulullah. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't know, but I truly love this daughter of mine. I have other children, but she's very special. And I want you, Ya Rasulullah, to take a glance at her. I feel that she has potential. She's going to have a bright future. And he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in his dream that came to him, that hugged Nafisa and said, I also love her. Not only me, but Allah also loves her. So at a very young age, five or six years old, a Sayyid Nafisa would attend the class of Al-Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadr. She would attend the class of Al-Imam al-Baqir. She would attend the class of Al-Imam al-Rida. This is the status of this woman. And by the time she became a teenager, she was one of the brightest students of Ahl al-Bayt. She was a faqih, a mujtahid, as a teenager. So Imam al-Sadiq asked her to marry his son Ishaq. And a very beautiful story. She had many people who asked for her hand and she rejected. She had many people who asked for her hand and her father would ask her and she says, No, oh father, I am not ready for marriage. Until the books of history say that she slept and she saw Fatima to Zahra sallallahu alayha in her dream. That says, I want you to marry the son of Imam al-Sadiq, my son Ishaq. So the next day Imam al-Sadiq sent after her and he asked her to marry her son Ishaq. She became the student of the sixth Imam. The seventh Imam, but the seventh Imam was mostly in prison. So the eighth Imam, Imam al-Rida was the teacher in the Masjid of Rasulullah. And she was a special student of Imam al-Rida. After Imam al-Rida left to Khurasan, she can no longer bear staying in Medina. So she left Medina. And this is of course due to the circumstance that's Bani al-Abbas, Harun al-Abbasi, al-Mu'tasim al-Abbasi had created for Bani Hashim, for the children of Rasulullah and the city of Medina. When she went to Egypt, she began her journey out of Medina to Hajj. And they say in her biography that she did Hajj 30 times, 30 times, 25 times of which she went barefoot, walking from Medina to Mecca with Imam al-Sadiq. Al-Imam al-Hassan and Imam Hussein. They did 30 Hajj, where they would walk barefoot from Mecca, from Medina to Mecca. People would come, they would stop, they say, Ya Abna Rasulullah, how can we ride and you're walking? So they say, we have not taken the main route so that you don't see us, you don't feel ashamed. We have taken the side route so that you go on your own. They say they saw a young man between Mecca and Medina, he was walking with a very small, tiny bag of a little bit of bread. And he was walking by himself. They asked him, Man ant? Who are you? Where are you going? Where is your food? What is your destination? So he said, Rahilati Rijlan. My Cattle, my horse, my camel, are my feet. Wazadi taqwai. And the food that you're asking of is my taqwa and piety. Wa maqsadi mawlai. And my destination is my mawla, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They ask him, who is he? He said, Qurashi, Arabi, Hishami, Hashimi. They asked him, what is your father's name? al Hussein. what is your name? Ali, Ali ibn al Hussein, Zayn al-Abidin. All by himself. 
زادي تقواي وراحلتي رجلاي ومقصدي So she went to Hajj and from Hajj she went towards Jerusalem she stayed for several days paying her respect to the grave of Ibrahim al-Khalil and from there she went towards Egypt they say that the entire city of Qahara the entire country of Egypt had come to welcome and greet a Sayyidina Nafisa. So when she went, the governor of Egypt, the ulama of Egypt came, and one of the men of Egypt gave his home, his residence to Sayyidina Nafisa. And from the next day, she began to teach. She began to teach fiqh, she began to teach tafsir, she began to teach the the hadiths of Rasulullah. And one day there was a man by the name of Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Idris who came to become one of her students. Who is he? Al-Imam al-Shafi'i. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i was the student of the granddaughter of Rasulullah, the granddaughter of Imam al-Hasan. They say that he would come and he would sit like a abd, a servant in front of Sayyidina Musa. Hearing from her the hadith of Rasulullah. Today every Shafi'i around the world is indebted to Sayyidina Nafisa and Sayyidina Nafisa is indebted to Ja'far ibn Muhammad. The fountain of knowledge. We don't have anything against the other madahib but it all traces to one man, Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Al-Imam al-Sadiq, Abu Hanifa says, لَوْلَ السَّنَتَانِ لَا لَكَ النُّعْمَانِ If it wasn't for the two years that I was the student of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, I would not have any sort of knowledge. And then who came? Al-Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the greatest muhaddith in the Sunni school of thought, with the greatest collection of hadith. They both became her students. They became individuals who narrated hadith from Sayyidina Nafisa. Days later she informed them that she wants to return to Medina. They say that the people of Egypt came begging her that now that you've come to our land we will not let you leave us. We cannot lose this ni'mah. Why is it that you're leaving? She says, because all my time is being occupied in teaching. And I no longer have time for the Qur'an and tasbih and dhikr. So they made a schedule for her. Half of the day she spends in dhikr, in dua, in Qur'an. And half of the day she spends in tasbih, in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And amongst the greatest of stories that I found in her biography was that she had a Jewish neighbor with a crippled handicapped child. This child tells her mother that I want you to take me to the house of Sayyidina Nafisa. So her mother brings her and puts her in the house of a Sayyidina Nafisa. As Sayyidina Nafisa begins to do her salat, she does her salat, and after a while she brings a bucket of water, she sits this child, she does wudu, and the water of her wudu splashes on this ill Jewish child. Several hours later, her mother comes knocking at the door of Sayyidina Nafisa, to pick up her child, her daughter is the one that goes and opens the door for her. She sees that her child has received cure from the water splash of the wudu of Sayyidina Nafisa, the granddaughter of Imam al-Hasan. So she informs all the Jews in, 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 in Egypt. And the Jews who converted in the year 155 onwards. 160, 170 after the Hijrah of Egypt are all indebted to Sayyidina Nafisa. She gathered them. She told them of the miracle. 
They came. They all embraced the religion of Islam and her presence. And amongst the books of history, if you read the books of history, they say that during her stay, the Nile River had gone completely dry. So they came to her. Sayyidatana, Mawlatana, what is it that you can help us with? So they say she was so in tune with her salah. She was so in tune with her dua that after she was done, she took the hijab that she wears when she prays salat al layl and she conducts her salah and she told them to throw this in the Nile River. And as soon as they threw that hijab, that purified hijab in the Nile River, the water came back in the Nile River. This is a biography of a woman that is the grandson of Imam al-Hassan, a granddaughter of Imam al-Hassan, married to the son of Imam al-Sadiq. Now can we, can a personality like me stand to explain to you the magnitude and the greatness of a personality like a Sayyid Zainab? Like Al-Aqil Zainab, the daughter of Amir al muminin An Imam, a Ma'asum says to her, Anti Alima, Muallima. You're a scholar. You have been given knowledge without anybody that teaches you. You are inspired by Amir al muminin the door of the knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And she was that personality that protected so many Imams, whether it was emotional or physical. She was the one that gave emotional support to Imam al-Hassan, to her father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he lost his beloved wife, Fatima, and she had to witness the death of, the death of her grandfather, Rasulullah, the death of her mother, Fatima, then the martyrdom of her father Amir al muminin the departure of her brother Imam al Hassan. So the day of Ashura was very difficult for her because the last person that Sayyidah Zainab had was her brother Hussein. She did not care for losing her children, for her cousins, but she saw that Hussein was the last hope that she had. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله